We're starting here with a photo called Graft. This is a sculpture by, by Roxy Pine that I was lucky enough to visit in um, Washington, D.C. Uh, his tree is beautiful, but it's not the only one. There's a veritable forest of metal tree sculptures that are now springing up. And here's um, Douglas Coupland's golden tree going up in Vancouver now as well. So the irony here of using metal to make a tree when I'm trying to use trees to make metals is, is amusing. But anyhow, let's, let's press on. So as Lara said, I work at the Centre for Novel Agricultural Products. And it's not just all Eppendorf's and Petri dishes. We've got a lovely city here with some very old lumps of stone you can see there. Uh, for Harry Potter fans, we've got J.K. Rowling's Diagonal Alley. And, and for the more stomach focused, I think you're closer to lunchtime than I am. We've got Betty's Tea Rooms, where you can chomp on the finest pastries or a Yorkshire fat rascal if you want to come and visit. Um, our lovely green Lake Stream campus is to the southeast of York. And so we're in a building just about here. And um, we've got, if I zoom in on the lab now, I can see, look, there's loads of boffins working real time in our labs. So uh, let's see what we've all been up to. Um, I'm a plant biotechnologist and I'm researching how plants can be used to clean up environmental pollutions. So today I'm going to focus on these four areas of my research. I'm looking at phytomining precious metals and rare earth elements. We're going to focus a little on nickel and the implant chelate bound form, uh, but also gold and platinum group metals and implant and nanoparticles in the tissues and the downstream uses of this metal rich biomass. So why fight to mine metals? Well, because our reserves are running out simply, we're using it all up. For one, the mining process, it, it also has an enormous carbon footprint per, per kilogram of metal and thus really high adverse environmental impacts. So once mined, even if there's plenty left, we should be reusing, not just mining more. Um, another reason why we might want to recover these metals is the natural deposits are often geopolitically highly concentrated so there are lots in Russia, for example, and, and they're maybe not so keen to trade uh, with our countries. I know that, that South Africa have got a lot of platinum group metals and you're much friendlier. So hopefully, hopefully there's, there's something there for everyone. Um, there's also an increasing demand for some of these metals in emerging technologies like, like your mobile phone. It's really important. I can't live without that. Or um, climate change tackling technologies like uh, wind turbines, for example. So it's about... 360 kilograms of neodymium, uh, a rare earth element, per two megawatt wind turbine. Uh, and one kilogram of neodymium is needed per Toyota Prius. And there's about three million of those on the planet. So there's also at the moment, no effective substitutes for these elements. And the diagram at the bottom here was produced by um, a lovely collaborator, Tom Goodall. He's a, he's a really, really nice guy. And they do some amazing work at Yale. And, and they've also done some really beautiful life cycle analysis on our, our research too. But back to this table, it shows the criticality of some metals here in terms of environmental effects. And Tom's diagram gives a criticality score and you can see how vulnerable our supply of platinum group metals and gold is in the center in this, in this red area. Um, additional analysis also gives kind of quite worrying figures for time until they run out. Uh, and so the other, other metals and elements that I've circled, some of these are, are, are gonna run out in the next 50 years or sooner. And so uh, we really need to be <laughs> much more responsible with these elements and, and recover them from the environment. Um, so obviously the next question is where have they all gone? Well, once mined <laughs> humans, we've diluted and dispersed them willy nilly around the planet. And uh, uh, my favorite example of this is the use of platinum group metals in the catalytic converters on vehicle exhausts. Um, so we've got rather good at recycling the converters at their end of the life, but you can see from this chart, we use just a worldwide consumption of palladium, uh, 240 odd uh, metric tons was used in those catalytic converters on vehicles. Um, by the end of their life, over 50% of this metal will be recycled, and that is great. But the other 50% has been strewn across all the motorways, urban roads, and other roads across the planet. And we found detectable levels of platinum group metals in road sweepings from the roads around Yorkshire. So you can almost say that the roads are paved with gold, and there's many reasons why we want to recover these metals. There's one. 
So one place where there are lots of residual metals is in the mine tailings from the mining industry and legacy mines as well. And here's a picture of one in British Columbia. But you can also see a big problem here. The mine wastes, often as slurries, are stored indefinitely as tailing dams. And here you can see what happens when they're breached, the catastrophic environmental damage um, with climate change triggering some more flooding. These dam breaches are becoming more common and sadly, many examples of this, particularly in, in developing countries as well. And um, yeah, some really, really sad pictures there. You can you can take in uh, the legacy that, that, that we have to clean up in some countries as well. And not to bang on about it too much, but, but this is a very pressing and current problem. Here's a BBC News article from just three weeks ago, not, not focusing on, on Keith Richards' arthritis, but the, um, the metal mining pollution impacting 23 million people worldwide. So it's clearly a, an, an issue that we, we really need to address. So my, my, my job and the thing that I really, really love is, is to use plants to, to tackle these things. So one thing we want to do is, is phyto mining. What can this offer? So um, first of all, it can offer environmental restoration. Often these mined areas and other industrial sites such as smelting factories are often denuded of life. And you can see that in this picture of mining in Brazil here, nothing much is growing around these areas. So plants offer a way to revegetate and phytostabilize these areas. Uh, and with economic restoration, such as tourism and farming, that, that can follow on and lead to a, uh, producing land and, and an area as it was before the mine was there. That will be the, the holy grail of this. So often there are still significant quantities of metals on these sites, but the concentrations are not financially feasible to mine using conventional techniques. So recovery using plants can be a cost effective alternative. And an added bonus is that any recovered metal or eco metal can be a premium price. So uh, Elon Musk has, has said that he's willing to pay more for eco batteries for his Teslas. So metal nickel that's being derived or plucked gently from the soil by plants is worth more than if it's mined in a very environmentally uh, intensive, in a very uh, chemically intensive process. So this all seems like a great idea, but as you can perhaps tell from the photo, these metals are often at phytotoxic levels and plants struggle to reestablish on these sites. But there are some special magic plants out there that perhaps some of you have already heard of that we can use that will thrive in metal rich soils. And these are called hyperaccumulators. Um, they have an amazing ability to selectively take up metals. And with this exquisite biology, they can concentrate the metals to many thousand fold in their tissues. Here in the center of the screen is, is my favorite. I think this is Pycnandra, a tropical tree that grows in Sabah in Malaysia. And the bark here has been cut and I, I, I can't condone the, the attacking of trees like this, but you can see that the, um, the sap is blue in color. And honestly, this has not been Photoshopped. This sap contains an incredible 40% by weight nickel. So, wow, this is really a source of metals that we can get from plants. You can see that there are species here that accumulate zinc, cadmium, thallium or lead an incredible fern species that loves to suck up the metalloid arsenic. And there are also hyperaccumulators that will take up rare earths, that I'll talk about a little bit later. So we want to harness this powerful biology to address the environmental problems of the mining and recycling. And here I've got a schematic from a recent uh, Perspectives article showing the biology behind hyperaccumulators. And my example on the left is this plant that's been kind of cartoon drawn here is um, is from a, a South African mine. Actually, it's Bokea codii, which will hyperaccumulate nickel and the, the mining company grow it around the mine site and use it to recover additional metal that's come out from the factory. And they put that back in and smelt it back down and, and get nickel back from it. But these species are not necessarily suitable for fighting mining the metal pollution in the swathes of temperate land in northern Europe and America, for example. What we really need are high biomass crop species such as willow, and that's what we really focus on in our research. They'll grow well in these temperate climates. There are no known hyperaccumulator species for these temperate regions. Um, we've also got existing agriculture to grow these species. We know how to do it. 
and we're already using biomass crops for power. So Drax, which is the power station with a, a Marvel comic name, is just up the road from me, and it's using plant biomass right now to power this presentation. But a hurdle is that these plant, these high biomass species like willow are not hyperaccumulators, and they have a relatively no, low non-selective metal uptake rates. So our ultimate research goal is to use synthetic biology techniques to produce high biomass synthetic hyperaccumulator willows that can suck the metal from the soil, soil, cleaning it like a hoover. And for this, I'm going to talk you through a four pronged approach. So our first step is solubilization. A lot of these metals, gold, palladium and nickel, commonly exist in zero valent forms in the soil. Think like Hanker Ma finding gold nugget during the, uh, the US gold rush in the 1800s. You know, it, it, or perhaps stories you hear of people dropping a wedding ring in the soil and finding it years later absolutely unchanged or um, Egyptian jewellery or something dug out from a Scottish bulk that's made of gold is unchanged. These metals don't readily solubilise, but plants need these metals to be in a cation form for uptake. So we need to get this, make this happen. So... To do this, some plants and rhizospheric soil bacteria exude compounds, including cyanogenic ones, that can selectively mobilise metals. And perhaps these could be used to promote uptake of our target metals. On top of this, there are complex interactions between plants and soil microbes. And some bacteria have plant growth promoting properties, so they're able to increase the ability of the plant to withstand environmental stress. <laughs> Excuse me. Such as metal pollution. So we're investigating this plant microbe interaction further, working with people like Kevin Lingard, a long-standing collaborator at Willow Consultancy called Crops for Energy, and companies that work with plant biomass, such as Green Lizard and Q Technologies. And also Professor Bill Freeman here, who's recently moved back from York to Finland, and who's also collaborating on some of our projects, providing his expertise on soil microbes. But first, I need to give credit to the uh, the founding father, the, the gold father of phyto mining, the great Chris Anderson, who over the years has generously shared his expertise, time and boundless energy. One of the things that Chris found in, in um, 1998 was that plants could be used to harvest gold. But obviously, with the solubility was still an issue. So here, what we did, we screened rhizospheric and endothetic bacteria for plant growth promoting properties such as um, ACC deaminase, derophore production, uh, indolacetic acid, all, comp all components that together enable these bacteria to help promote the growth of plants. Um, we've also screened the bacteria for cyanide producing properties to enable them to solubilize our metals. And then we've taken uh, a consortium of bacteria and watered those into willow plants growing with and without nickel. And our first results are promising, but not conclusive. And you can see here, if you look at the, the bar chart here on, on the top, on the left, uh, when just the bacteria are watered in, we do see an enhanced level of growth, the, the biomass of the plants, they get bigger. But in the presence of nickel, actually the plants are really not doing as well. And what it looks like, what's happening here, and this isn't, this is just a trend at the moment, we need more data, but it looks like the presence of the bacteria is enabling the nickel to be solubilized and these plants are taking up more nickel. So it's actually kind of what we want. We just now have to enable the plants to withstand the toxicity of that increased metal concentration in their tissues. And we see similar trends when we use cyanogenic plants. And so here's a little graph on the right here where we grew these plants, Lotus japonicus. Uh, it's called, um, it, it looks like this. I can't remember the... <laughs> I can't remember the common name at the moment. Bird's foot trefoil, that's it. And um, uh, some collaborators here, Fred Rook uh, and colleagues, produced um, mutants that don't, that are cyanogenic, the deficient lotus plants. And so we were able to do a comparison using plants that could produce cyanide and those that did not. And we grew them in soil with a range of nickel concentrations. And this was just a single experiment. So perhaps these concentrations are a little bit high. Uh, and we could, we could move in here and try some other concentrations at the moment. So uh, here you can see that the cyanogenic uh, wild type 
is got quite a low uh, concentration on the soil when when the nickel is present, whereas the A cyanogenic grows a higher biomass. But when we use ICP and we look at the levels of nickel in these tissues, we can see perhaps why the wild type is not growing as well. It's because it's got a lot more nickel in it. So bacteria and cyanogenic plants, either way, it looks like these are methods we could use to solubilize the plant, the, the metals from the soil. So if we've solubilized them, the next step is uptake. And this is, this is shown here. What we want to do is translocate the metals into the plants and ideally to the aerial parts of the tissues. And several PhD students have worked on this. And Zach in the middle now is, is now teaching at a university back in Malaysia. Jess has just graduated on the right there. And our Andy Taylor is now head of policy, integrity and performance here at University of York. So I hope we have taught him well. Um, and together we've worked on uh, studying a range of different transporters, uh, one of which is COP2 here. And um, on the next slide, you can see some, some data showing that when we express COP2 from Arabidopsis in yeast, uh, here we can see it's, it's galactose in, induced. So in the presence of copper, the uh, COP2 expressing yeast takes up so much copper that it inhibits the growth. Uh, and you can see the same happens with gold. Uh, and also now we've shown that this happens with palladium as well. So we have a transporter here, an example of a transporter that we can potentially manipulate to uh, take up metals that we're, we want to target. Uh, we also got some data here on the left. When we knock out the COP2 transporter, we can see that we have a decrease in the uptake of the metal um, in the knockout lines compared to wild type as well. So, so that's one transporter. And the second transporter that we've worked on is a, a rare earth element transporter from a hyperaccumulator plant called Dicronopteris. And this is um, a fern. And I'm going to present a little bit of work that's been done by our, our Chinese colleagues here. And here they are standing in front of um, not a, a castle in China, but a castle in Yorkshire. This is Castle Howard. And uh, our, our lovely collaborators came over. We had a great visit. And we're now working on future directions we can look at to uh, address these transporters and, and manipulate them and make the specificity uh, tighter and transfer it across into uh, relevant species as well. And so some of the work that we've recently published, uh, here you can see the Dicronopteris, the fern. Um, and one thing that's immediately obvious is that when it's fed rare earths, which it will naturally take up in its uh, natural environment, it enhances the biomass of these plants. Uh, and you can see that in this graph here, the, the, surface, the, the aerial biomass is significantly enhanced at relatively low levels of rare earths. Uh, and this has been known for a long time, since the kind of 1970s. And indeed, China have been adding rare earth elements to their agricultural soils since the late 1970s, specifically to promote plant growth. Uh, so the underlying mechanism is something that's not still not well studied, but it, it's a very interesting phenomenon. and. We've used these plants to then identify a transporter. And this is this is predominantly the work that they've done in China. Uh, and we show here that the um, the rare earth transporter, the, these plants, when, when you feed them a range of metals, the, the putative transporter is um, competed with aluminium for uptake. <laughs> Excuse me again. Uh, and once we identify it, we found that it was um, an NRAMP like transporter localizing the root plasma membrane. So it's transferring from the root cell to the cytoplasm. And it has high affinity for rare earths, but specifically for the light rare earths. So the lanthanum, uh, europium, up to just before europium in the periodic table. So there is some specificity there. Um, and the biology behind that is something that we're really, really keen to investigate further. So the next step is to look at how we might recover some of these elements from our waste sources. And we've done some work here with the, uh, the waste industry, uh, including coal fly ash, which is, is known, known to be rich in rare earth elements. Uh, we've used a range of different hyperaccumulator species and found that they can actually grow in coal fly ash at, at, at 90%. So um, this, is, this, is, this alone was quite a miracle finding. Plants still uh, never cease to amaze me with their tenacity that they'll grow in all sorts of places. So we grew them on this kind of fly ash and we found that they did indeed take up the rare earths, uh, but the fly ash is very, very alkaline. It's a pH of nearly 10, 
And even though we amended this to, to bring the, the pH down, we could see that there was a tight correlation with soil pH and rare earth uptake. So you really need a low pH for rare earth element uptake. However, we've already learned quite a lot about that. And we've learned that there's um, a, a really, really high uh, in-plant capacity for rare earth elements. So what we're now doing is looking at how we can uh, recover the rare earths from the biomasses and how we can control the pH in, in these waste products to, again, going a step back to that solubilization point. So the next step is um, understanding the responses uh, to, to, to target more the, the transporters and to understand how plants can withstand that toxicity. And so here we've done a, a transcriptomics uh, experiment on willow to, to try and move our, our research into those the relevant crop species, the biomass uh, crop species rather. Uh, and so we've grown 20 different willow species plus or minus nickel to see if we can pull out the ones that are tolerant and sensitive. And, and that's pretty much what we've got. So we've got on the left here, we've identified some nickel sensitive lines and on the right, some nickel resilient lines. So in the absence of nickel, these plants on the left, they grow like absolute stink. And indeed, three of these are biomass bred, specifically biomass uh, willow crops. Uh, but you can see when they're given nickel that it really, really impacts their biomass production by, by maybe 60 or 70 percent in, in some of these cases. Whereas our, our nickel resilient lines are, are, are not nearly as affected. And to show this perhaps much more visibly, if you can see what the plants actually look like following our treatment, the, uh, the resolution, this biomass plant on the left here, it's completely dead in the presence of the nickel, whereas this more um, old traditional variety corkscrew is you know, barely, barely bothered. Um, so this is a really nice result and it's enabled us to pull together a collection of uh, sensitive lines and resistant lines. And then when we measure the, me the levels of nickel in the tissues, you can see that the sensitive lines are full of nickel, whereas the resistant lines are very low levels of nickel. They're excluding the nickel. And so we know there's some biological mechanisms behind that. And we've done some transcriptomics studies now, and we're just in the process of characterizing some genes back from that. And so hopefully we'll be able to develop uh, ways that we can make the willow resist and detoxify that nickel. So uh, the next bit here that I'm going to talk about is adding value to that metal rich biomass. So quite often we need to find additional financial incentive incentive <laughs> incentive to to fund these revegetation schemes. And one other way to add further um, value to nickel rich biomass is um, catalysis. And from this research, we've published methods demonstrating how we can manipulate the production of platform chemicals such as levoglucosinone from the plant biomass or how it can be used directly as a catalyst for industrially important chemical steps, such as hydrogenation. So most recently, we've had some exciting results showing how we can depolymerize polystyrene back to its monomer components. So this is particularly exciting as melting and reforming polystyrene can only be done a few times before the additives such as colorants inhibit that process. If you can rebuild the polystyrene from its monomers, you can repeat this indefinitely, like, like Lego, the Lego from my childhood is still in existence. I could still build those little houses if I wanted to. So a truly circular recycling of plastic could be achieved. So the third step is to look at metal binding proteins. So one side the plant, the metals we know cause damage. They interact with the electron transport system, generate reactive oxygen species that, that damage cellular components. Uh, metals can also disrupt proteins, inhibit critical cellular enzyme activities. And so we need, we need to mop them up as quickly as possible. And there are a number of well-studied metal binding proteins, such as phytochalatines, metallothionines, and some amino acids as well, that will tie up the metal, reducing its toxicity in the cell. And so that's, that's one area that we're very keen to, to focus on more, particularly with the willow. But... The final step is looking at nanoparticle formation in plants. And um, so I don't know if, if maybe you, you've heard about this already, but plants can naturally form nanoparticles of gold and palladium in their tissues if you feed them this. 
the, the metal rich biomass can then be processed for use as an implant catalyst. And this can add value to the metal recovery process. So one of the projects that I'm looking at is a project called Phyto for Metal. And this is developing an integrated phyto mining system for the recovery of metal nanoparticles from plant waste. Uh, I'm working with Lewis Novo at Scottish Rural College. Uh, he's the lead on this project and others at Edinburgh University, Scott Gold and Promethean Particles and an actual gold mine here. Who knew it? We've got one in Scotland. It's tiny, but it has gold in them, their hills. And so we're, we're looking at the native species that, that will grow in this area. And we're looking at solubilization techniques and we're developing methods to recover the nanoparticles directly from the plant tissues. So if you leave the nanoparticles in the tissue, you can use them to develop a, a catalyst to do synthetic biology. Um, not Sorry, to, to, to manipulate the gold nanoparticle sizes. Uh, so palladium and gold on carbon catalysts are worth five times the more, more the price of pure metal. And so using these nanoparticles in plant, it might be a way to reduce energy inputs and processing costs. And we've done some work with Tom Gridell on that. And this, this kind of looks quite encouraging. So the way that we would do this is you would, you would grow the plants on the mine tailing waste, develop plants that can accumulate these, and then doing a controlled pyrolysis, a microwave oven, if you like, under, under nitrogen, you can produce a, a carbonized scaffold of plant material with your baubles of gold or palladium like uh, like baubles on a Christmas tree, if you like, strewn through this. And you can use that as a catalyst. And here's some work done by Helen Parker here at York, uh, where she pyrolyzed at two different temperatures, uh, platinum rich plant biomass. And she showed uh, that following the pyrolysis step, different uh, size nanoparticles were present in the material. So we can have some here that she called PD300 and PD800. And at 300 degrees, the nanoparticles were smaller than they were at the higher temperature, higher pyrolysis step. She then did a range of um, uh, chemical reactions, one shown here, which is the HEC reaction of iodobenzene and methyl, uh, to produce methyl um, cinnamate. Uh, so here you can see the, the palladium 300 has got a much faster reaction time than the 800. And this is because the, uh, the nanoparticles of the 300 are much smaller, so they have a larger surface area and they're more reactive. Um, we've also shown that the, uh, the 300 can be used many more times over because the small nanoparticles are more likely to be retained on the biomass. Uh, they're not going to they're not going to leave the cat catalyst and get and get washed away. So uh, there's some interesting, useful parameters for this this um, this PD 300. So that was all done in Arabidopsis, where we dose the plants with um, palladium from Sigma, which which is is clearly not the way you would produce this uh, in a commercial company. But uh, big questions to ask are like how much palladium would be needed to achieve catalytic catalytic activity. And so in this little graph picture here, on the top here, we can see the Arabidopsis that we saturated with palladium, we used 10 millimolar, and, and we had fantastic uh, catalytic activity, which is shown in the green bar underneath. So the plants were 8% dry weight palladium. So this is, this is amazing. So we could use less, we could drop it to 10 to 1 millimolar palladium, uh, and we, we see already a drop in the catalytic activity. Then we tried some, some plants that we think might be relevant for remediating from the environment. So mustard, miscanthus and willow. And you can see this really, really hits our, our um, catalytic activity. So willow on the end here, when we're growing in this SOM, this is synthetic or media. So we're, it's like a mine tailing waste that we've artificially created. Uh, so using this with willow, we only get a 0.13% um, palladium concentration in the plant and, and a dismal 1.2% um, uh, catalytic activity. So clearly there, there's, there's work to do, but, but it does work. So um, what do we do? Where do we go next? We're, we're going back to the willow again, and we've, we've screened a range of uh, different willow species. And you can see the rods of willow here just showing the the color variation in the stems alone, uh, we found just in these few uh, species here, a sevenfold difference in the ability to take up palladium from this synthetic or medium. 
And, and just here in the UK alone, we've got a, a national willow collection with over 300 willow accessions based at Rothamsted. So there are there's clearly a lot more biological variety out there to be explored and, and mechanisms to understand. And this is this is work that we really, really want to look at. But for the, for the last bit of my talk, I want to look at how we've used synthetic biology to manipulate the gold nanoparticle size for that implant catalysis. So I mentioned briefly earlier that the smaller nanoparticles are the ones that make the best catalysts. And so um, once the, uh, the chemist has explained it to me, uh, we started some work to manipulate the size of the nanoparticles in planter. Uh, and to do this work, we focused on gold because it's very electron dense. And so the nanoparticles were easily easy to visualize using a transmission electron microscope. And the gold also has good catalytic activities. So um, the schematic here shows uh, five peptide sequences and how these interact with gold ions. And so if you can see, the aromatic acids within each peptide shown here in these little central bits. Uh, they exhibit different reducing and binding capacities such that the different amino acid combinations results in different nanoparticle size deposition. So tryptophan, the W for example, and shown in the two right-hand side boxes has relatively high reducing capability. So it reduces the gold ions to atoms but it has low binding properties, so it can't hold on to as many atoms as the tyrosine in the sequences on the left hand side, which has greater binding properties. And the end result is that the peptide sequences on the right hand side produce smaller nanoparticles than the peptides on the left. So that's if you were to put these peptides literally into a glass beaker with a solution of gold and stir it. These are the peptides that you would see. So working with green chemistry, We've demonstrated that plant biomass expressing these small nanoparticles has increased catalytic activity. Um, and what we've got to do next is to um, is to show 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 the data and, and understand how this occurs. And so, what we've done is we've taken these small these small uh, sequences here and we've expressed them in Arabidopsis. And uh, what I want to do next is a little quiz game show to, to keep you awake for the last few minutes. Uh, I don't know if anyone ever saw this. It's it's quite an old one, but it's from my youth. This is a Bruce Forsyth, a celebrity in the UK uh, from a while back, who used to play a, a quiz show called uh, Play Your Cards Right. So higher or lower than the preceding card. So. The first slide here that I'm going to show you is um, implanter nanoparticle analysis of the peptides expressing the extra large nanoparticle seeding peptide. So we've analyzed one leaf per line, three independently transformed lines using transmission electron micrographs. And these images are taken of the plastid region. And then we've measured the, uh, the, the profile diameters using image J. So on the right hand side here, you can see the profiles of the wild type and our three extra large expressing uh, transgenic lines. So don't focus on the graphs. I want you to focus on the spots. It's all about the spots. So are these spots bigger or smaller than the large nanoparticle seeding lines? So that's the extra large and this is the large. OK, do the spots get smaller? Then we express them in the medium seeding lines blue here. And finally, we put them in the small nanoparticle seeding lines, the small nanoparticles here. Oops, I've got a typo there. I apologize. Small nanoparticle lines here. So hands up anybody. Do you think they got bigger or smaller? Did you spot the difference? Well, I'm hoping that you thought that the spots got smaller because we couldn't really tell on the microscope. But when we analyzed the data, that's what we found. And so I've, I've summarized that on the graph on the left here. And you can see that the Arabidopsis plants expressing the extra large nanoparticles had less of the, the, the smaller nanoparticle sizes, whereas the small nanoparticle expressing lines had lots of small nanoparticles. And we saw the reverse trend as well when we looked at the, the really large nanoparticle sizes. So we then took this material and we gave it to the chemists here at York and they did some pyrolysis. Here they did um, an oxidation of, of lactate to uh, of a propan. Uh, sorry, one, two propandiol to lactate under basic conditions. And you can see the wild type conversion rate was, was here on the scale. And then our transgenic lines for extra large, large, medium and small, we're seeing uh, 
potentially an increase here. These are more than the extra large, but there's no difference here. Uh, this catalysis. So smaller nanoparticles make better catalysts. So there's some synthetic biology that we can we can target with at the end of our our four prong approach to um, increase in plant and metal. We've got solubilization, uptake, binding, and in the case of the, uh, the precious metals and the platinum group metals, nanoparticle formation. So by combining these approaches, you can see the overarching research plan to produce high biomass synthetic hyperaccumulator species. And alongside this, I've been working with colleagues at Green Chemistry to take that step further and add value to those plants. So the future directions are here and, and I'm hopefully by upregulating pathways and metal sequestering techniques, potentially synthetic organelles, for example, we hope to develop a suite of metal specific artificial hyperaccumulators, perhaps one day the Salix Nickel Rylottii. So um, thank you very much for listening. And I hope that was interesting and you enjoyed your lunch. Thank you.